Hello, I'm Joshua Matthews. In this portion of the class, we're going to do the top housing removal and remove the control cover. To start off, we are going to loosen the compression nut on the candy cane. Take a pair of channel locks, unloosen the compression nut on the candy cane, grab the candy cane and pull the candy cane straight away from the top housing. When doing this, Ensure that the O-ring stayed on top of the candy cane and they did not fall into the ground. This is important as if they fall off, you will leak water in the tank when the pump is later reinstalled. Next, we're going to take soapy water and spray our breather tube and our pump cable. So now we can feed our cables and tube down into the top housing to make removal of the top housing a lot easier. This is going to provide a slack for when we pull the top housing off the pump. We can set it down on the ground and work on the pump a lot easier. To remove the top housing from the pump, there's four bolts that hold it in place. Take your half inch wrench and socket and undo the four bolts. Once the four nuts are off, pull, pull the four bolts from the top housing. Once the four bolts are removed, now pull the top housing directly up away from the pump. As you're doing this, Push the slack through on the pump cable and the breather tube. So you can set the top housing down on the ground while working on the pump. Once we remove the top housing, now we are going to remove the check valve from the pump. To remove the check valve, there are four screws, 716 hex screws that hold this in place. Take a 716 socket and wrench and remove the four screws. Once the four screws are removed, we're going to grab the check valve and pull the check valve straight away from the pump. Once the check valve is removed, there is an O-ring that sits at the bottom of it. Sometimes the check valve O-ring falls off or gets stuck in the motor head discharge. Ensure that the O-ring goes back onto the check valve. If this is not replaced, water will leak around the check valve. Next, we're going to test and disassemble our level sensor housing. To perform this test, we need a manometer, a digital manometer, a ham pump, an isolation valve, and a Y or T fitting. To do this test, we are going to pull the breather tube off the equalizer. Like so. Now we're going to take our Y fitting and connect our Y fitting to the breather tube. We're going to take our digital manometer and turn it on. If we look closer here, the manometer, when it is on, says INWC. This stands for inches in water. This is the, the measure we want to be in. Take your hand pump and we're going to pump it up to 82.0 to 90.0 on the manometer. Once we pump the level sensor housing up to 82.0 to 90.0, we're going to close the isolation valve. This is going to hold pressure on the level sensor housing to ensure that we have a proper seal on the gasket, the hummel, the barb fitting. Once this is pumped up to 82.0, we're going to grab our stopwatch. 
take your stopwatch and hit start and let this test run for 40 seconds. At the end of our 40 seconds, we're going to write down our first reading. 40 seconds, we have 89.3. We're now going to wait another 30 seconds and write down our second reading. We have 89.0. Our test dropped 0.3. On pump serial numbers 353, 742 and lower, we have an acceptance loss of 0.5 on our manometer test. But for pump serial numbers 353, 742 and higher, they are only allowed to lose 0.1. If you have a greater loss than 0.5, we need to take our soapy water and spray our soapy water around our barb fitting, our liquid tight cord grip, our Y portion of our cable to ensure that we have no nicks in our cable and around the two halves to where the gasket is on the level center housing. We are trying to determine where our leak is in our level center housing. This is super important to fix for the next time that the pump is reinstalled. If it is not fixed, it will fail later down the road. Once our leak is determined, we would then replace either the barb fitting or the liquid tight core grip when we go into repairing the level center housing. Once we have completed our level center housing test, we are now going to remove the clips on the bottom and cut the zip tie at the top to remove the, the level center housing from casting. Take your tool and get underneath the tab to remove the clip. Pry the tool away from the level center housing and the clip will pop off. After we have done the clips, we are now going to take off the zip tie. Take a pair of dykes and cut the zip tie around the cable. Now we are going to grab the level center housing and pull the air columns away from the pump and pull the level center housing directly away from the, the core. There are four screws that hold the level center housing together. We are now going to take our screw gun and remove these four screws. Once you have backed the four screws out of the inserts, you can now pull the two halves apart. Inside of the level center housing, we have two retaining clips, two pressure switches, four wires, and a gasket. We are going to remove all of this to reassemble our level center housing. First, grab a pair of needle nose and remove the two retaining clips. Once the retaining clips are removed, we are now going to remove the flag terminals located on the pressure switches. Once the flag terminals are removed, we are going to remove the gasket. Now we are going to remove the on-off switch from the on-off side of the level center housing. Grab a pair of needle nose and grab the black plastic of the on-off switch. Once you have grabbed the plastic, pull and twist on the on-off switch. The on-off switch should pop right out. Once you have removed the on-off switch, we are now going to go to the alarm side of the level center housing. We are going to cut off the floor, four flag terminals that are located on the wires. We are now going to grab a pair of channel locks and loosen the liquid tight cord grip located on top of the level center housing. Once we have loosened the cord grip, we are going to pull the cable out of the alarm side of the housing. We now have space to remove our alarm switch from the alarm side of the housing. We are going to grab a pair of needle nose again and grab our black plastic on the alarm switch. 
Once you have the plastic, we're going to pull and twist the switch. The switch should pop right out. Once you have everything removed from the level center housing, we are going to take our two halves and inspect them. We are going to make sure they are dry and dirt free. Any water, moisture, or dirt trapped inside of this level center housing is going to stay in here once it's reassembled. This will cause damage to the switches. We are now going to reassemble our on-off side of our level center housing. We are going to take a new on-off switch and put it in the level center housing. The on-off side of the level center housing is the side of the housing that always goes with the barb fitting. Grab our on-off switch and place it into the level center housing. Make sure the stem of the switch is seated properly inside of the hole inside of the level center housing. We are now going to remove the barb fitting in the liquid tight cord grip from the level center housing. To remove the barb fitting, we first have to take off the hose clamp. Take a pair of needle nose and grab your hose clamp and remove it. Grab one side of the hose clamp and twist it away and it will pop right out of place. Once you have the hose clamp off, we are now going to remove the, bar, the breather tube that is on the barb fitting. Grab your breather tube and pull it off. Once you have pulled off the breather tube, when you reinstall this, we need to cut back an inch of the breather tube. Next, we're going to take a 5 inch, 5 eighths wrench and remove the barb fitting. Before we reinstall our new barb fitting, we need to take Loctite 598 and install it onto the barb fitting before we put it back into the housing. Take your Loctite 598 and install it to the first two or three threads of the barb fitting. Installing it on the first two or three threads is going to ensure that we get a nice even dis distribution of the Loctite 598 along all the threads. Once we have applied our Loctite 598, we're going to take our new barb fitting and screw it back into the level center housing. Screw your barb fitting in hand tight. Once you have it hand tight, grab your 5 8 wrench and give it two or three more turns. Be careful not to over tighten this barb fitting as you could strip it out. Now we are going to change our liquid tight cord grip. Take a 15 16 wrench and unscrew our liquid tight cord grip. Just as we did on the barb fitting, we're going to take our new Hummel and we're going to apply Loctite 598 to the first two or three threads. We also want to make sure that our liquid tight cord grip has an O-ring on it. This should come pre-installed from the factory. If it is not, we need to get an O-ring and install it. Take our Loctite 598 and again install it onto the first two or three threads of our liquid tight cord grip. Once we have applied the Loctite 598 to the liquid tight core grip, we are now going to reinstall this back into the level center housing. Tighten your liquid tight core grip down hand tight, and then again take your 5 16 wrench and give it two or three more turns. Again, we do not want to over tighten this liquid tight core grip because it could strip out.
Now that our liquid tight cord grip is installed, we're going to install our new alarm switch. Grab your alarm switch and Dow 111 silicone grease. We're going to take the silicone grease and install it to the O-rings that are located on the stem of the switch. This silicone grease is going to help slide the switch back into the housing and make it easier to reinstall and in case you ever have to take the switch out again. When installing the silicone grease, we want to make sure we do not clog the hole on the stem with the silicone, therefore the switch will operate incorrectly if we do. Once we have installed our silicone grease, we're going to take our alarm switch and install it back into our level center housing. The alarm side is the side with the liquid tight cord grip where the cable is entering the housing. Take your switch and install it into the port inside of the level center housing. Get the switch started and then give it a little firm press to ensure that the switch is in place. Now that the alarm switch is installed, we're going to take our Y portion of our cable and feed it back into the housing. Once the cable is installed into the housing, we're going to tighten down the cap on our liquid tight cord grip. This is going to keep any water from getting inside of the level center housing and corroding the switches. Once the end cable is installed, we are now going to strip back our wires and install four brand new flag terminals. Take a pair of wire strippers and strip back your wires. Once the wires are stripped back, we're going to take four new flag terminals and install them. After you crimp on the flag terminals, you want to give the flag terminal a little tug. We want to ensure that we have a nice, good, snug fit on the flag terminal. If not, the flag terminal over time could remove itself from the wire and cause the pump to fail. Now that we have installed the flag terminals to the wire, we're going to take our yellow and blue wires and give them a little twist. The twisting of the wires is to make it easier to put the two halves back together to ensure that none of the wires get pinched in between the two halves. We're going to take our yellow and blue wires and install them onto pins one and three on our alarm switch. The pins one and three on the alarm switch are the two outside pins. We're going to take the yellow and the blue wires and install them on the pins. The yellow wire goes on pin one, and the blue wire goes on pin three. Once you have installed the flag terminals onto the switch, push the, sw the wires down in front of the switch to keep it nice and neat for when you put the housing back together. Take your retaining clip and install it back into the housing. There is a little tab on the side of the housing that the retaining clip goes on. There's also a notch on the retaining clip that slides onto this notch inside of the housing. Our alarm side of the level center housing is done. We can now set this aside and reassemble our on-off side. Take your on-off housing and your brand new on off switch.
Again, take Dow 111 silicone grease and install it to the O-rings on the switch. Take your on-off switch and place it into the port inside of the level center housing. Once you have lined up the stem with the port, firmly press the switch into place. We're going to take our retaining clip and install it into the level center housing. Now we are going to take our new level center gasket and install it onto the housing. We are also going to install Dow 111 grease, silicone grease, onto the gasket. This is for when we put the two halves of the level center housing back together, it is going to provide a nice easy fit instead of having to fight the gasket and take the potential of rolling or pinching the gas gasket when putting the two halves together. Now that both housings are reassembled, we're going to take the brown and red wire and twist them. The brown and red wire go directly on the on-off switch, again on the pins one and three. Pins one and three are located on the outside of the switches. The red wire goes on pin one, and the brown wire goes on pin three. Once we have installed our wires back onto the pressure switches, we can now put the two halves back together. Turn the level center housing on its side and install one portion of the gasket into the housing. Once you have the bottom portion of the housing put together, Ensure that the wires are inside of the housing and not anywhere in, in between the gasket. Once this is done, push your two halves together. We are now going to take our four screws and screw them back into the housing. If you're using a drill to screw in your screws, you need to have your torque setting on a low speed and a low torque setting. The maximum torque setting that can be used on a screw gun is number five. If you over tighten these screws, you take the potential of stripping the screw or stripping the insert. If a screw or insert is stripped, it is going to become extremely difficult to remove the two shells and may have to potentially replace the whole level sensor housing. When we're screwing our four screws back into the level center housing, we want to ensure we do an X pattern when we're screwing them back in. This X pattern is going to ensure that we get a good, nice, tight, snug fit on the level center housing. When screwing the screws down, sometimes they don't go down all the way the first time. If this happens, reverse the screw back out and then go back down forward with it. It should go right into the insert the first time. If it does not go into the insert right away, reverse it out and go forward back down with it again. If you cannot get it to go in, do not turn the torque setting up on your screw gun to force the screw into the insert. It will strip out and you will have to replace the housing. Once you have the four screws back in, we're now going to do our manometer test again to ensure that we have no leaks in our level sensor assembly. Again, to perform this test, we need to hook our breather tube back up to our barb fitting and install our hose clamp. Take your hose clamp, spread it out, put it around the breather tube, get it started, and grab a pair of channel locks.
With the channel locks, we're going to squeeze the hose clamp the rest of the way. to ensure we have a nice snug fit on the breather tube so it cannot pull off at a later time. Once that is done, we're going to take our manometer test kit and pressure up our level center housing again. Take your manometer and turn it on and make sure your isolation valve is open so we can pressurize the level center housing. Now we're going to take our hand pump and pump it up to 82.0 to 90.0 on the manometer. Once we're in the 82.0 to 90.0 range, we're going to close our isolation valve. This is going to hold the pressure on the level center housing assembly. Once this is done, we're going to take our stopwatch and start it. We're going to wait 40 seconds. At the end of the 40 seconds, we're going to write down our first reading. At the end of our 40 seconds, we have 88.2. We're going to start our stopwatch again and wait another 30 seconds. At the end of 30 seconds, we have a reading of 88.2. Our loss was 0 .0. This means that our level center housing assembly is not leaking any pressure around the bar fitting, the liquid tight core drip, or the gasket. This is now ensuring us that we have a good tight seal in our assembly and we're not going to lose pressure over time. Now we're going to remove, air test and remove our control cover. To do this, we need to remove the eighth inch NPT air release plug that is inside of the casting. To do this, we have to scrape away the Loctite 598 that covers the air release plug. The Loctite 598 is covering the plug to ensure that the threads inside of the casting do not get corroded so we cannot remove the plug. With a scraper, a screwdriver, a knife, scrape away the Loctite 598. You may have to take a pair of needle nose or a little screwdriver and actually get inside of the air release plug to get the Loctite 598 out so you can fit your 3 16 wrench down into the air release plug. Once you have removed the Loctite 598, take your 3 16 Allen key and insert it into the hex plug. Once this is inserted, unscrew the air release plug. Once the air release plug is out, be sure to put this in a safe place as this is a vital part of the pump. If you relieve this air release plug out, water is allowed to get down into the casting and flood your control bracket. After the plug is removed, take your air release plug fitting and a little Teflon paste. Take the Teflon paste and install a little bit of the paste to the air release plug fitting. This Teflon paste is just ensuring that we have a nice good seal around the air release plug so we can get a proper test on the control cover. Install your fitting into the port where the air release plug sits and hand tighten it. Once it is hand tightened, get a piece of tube from your manometer test kit and install it onto your fitting. Take your hand pump and install it to the other end of the tube. We are now going to pump up the control cover up to 5 psi. Once you have reached 5 psi on your control cover, you're going to take soapy water and spray it around 
the split nut or the cable entry of the control compartment and we're going to spray it around where our radial O-rings are on the control cover. This soapy water is helping detecting a leak if there is one present. After holding 5 PSI on the control cover for a minute or so, you can then release the pressure from the control compartment. Now we're going to use our half inch socket and our wrench to remove the three bolts that hold the control cover to the casting. Once you have removed the three nuts, we're going to remove the three bolts from the control cover. Now we're going to take our pry bars and pry up the control cover away from the motor casting. This can be done on opposite sides of each other to ensure we get good proper lift on both sides. This is going to make it easier to remove the control cover. Get the pry bars underneath the tabs of the control cover and press down away from the top of the control compartment. This is going to move the control cover away from the top of the casting. Once you have pried it up, we're going to grab the control cover and flip it over. Once you have flipped it over, there is a guide pin in the fourth bolt hole. This is so we can take our control cover and set it on that guide pin to make it easier to work on our control bracket. With the co control cover sitting on the guide pin, this now allows us to have slack in our cable to make it easier to remove and rewire the control bracket. Hi, welcome back to the pump teardown and inspection portion of the training video. In this portion, we're going to cover controls, inspection, and operation. Once the control cover has been removed from the control compartment, the control bracket will be exposed. Control bracket has a few different components on it. We have the contactor, we have the start switch, we have the capacitor, as well as a thermal protector. As I go through this next portion, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about each one of these individual components. But right now, I'd like to talk about inspection of the compartment. Once the compartment's open, you'll want to inspect it for any signs of moisture. If there's any signs of moisture whatsoever within the compartment, you'll want to completely dry the compartment out and clean it and remove the entire control bracket. Also, upon your inspection, if you find any signs of burnt components, you'll want to replace the entire control bracket as well. You'll notice that there's a card inside of the control compartment, and that's your wiring diagram. We we'll want to use this a little bit later when we put this thing back together, but make sure you set it in a spot where you're going to remember it, because if you forget one thing, this is going to be the thing you're going to forget to put back in the pump upon rebuild. All right, let's look at each one of these individual components. I talked about this contactor a little bit earlier in the overview portion. Contactor has a coil and it has contacts. This side of the contactor is what we'll call the line side contacts. This side of the contactor is what we'll call the load side contacts. These three sets of contacts here are normally open contacts. So it's possible that I could take continuity readings across those contacts in a normal state to determine whether or not they're open or not. But the only way to truly test a contactor is to energize the coil, engage the contacts, and make sure the power is being transferred across. I'd like to demonstrate a couple of different ways that you can test the contactor. There again, I'm going to put my meter in a two million ohm scale, 2M or 2000K scale. Okay, and like I stated a while ago, the contacts that are on here are normally open. So I should read an open across this set of contacts, which I do, which is indicated by OL here on the meter. I should read an open on these set of contacts, and I should also read open on these set of contacts. The coil is located between A1 and A2 on the contactor. When probing the coil in the 2000K or 2M scale, I should get a reading of 0 .001 or 0 
And as you can see, the meter is reading 0 .001. So that's a pretty good indication that this contactor is probably okay. But like I said, the only way to truly test a contactor is to energize the coil, engage the contacts, and make sure that power is being transferred across from the line side to the load side. Depressing this plunger right here is not a valid way to test the contactor because I'm forcing them closed manually. If I want to test this pump contactor, I would need to apply power to the cable, and if I have someone available in the shop to help me, I would ask them to hit the manual run button. If the pump comes on when I hit the manual run button, then that's a good indication the contactor is doing exactly what it's supposed to. If the pump doesn't come on, then I can take a voltage reading from the A1 terminal, where the black L2 pump power wire is, to the 2T1 terminal, where the L1 power should be being transferred across to. Obviously, I don't have power applied to this, and I would like to say that you need to make sure that your meter's in the appropriate range to read 240 volts if you do have a live pump. If I had power applied to this and the contactor engaged, I should read 240 volts from these two points. In the event that you're in a shop by yourself and you don't have the uh, opportunity for someone to press the manual run button on the panel, you can always take your level sensor assembly, hook your vacuum slash pressure pump to it, pull a vacuum on the level sensor compartment which will force the diaphragm of the switches in an upward position and make the switches engage and it should bring the pump on redundantly from the panel. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the capacitor. The capacitor is used in conjunction with a start switch, which you can't really see right now, but I showed you earlier. It looks just like this. The capacitor is used to increase torque on the motor at startup to give you just a little kick to get the motor running. The only true way to test a capacitor is with a meter that measures microfarads. If you don't have the luxury of a meter that measures microfarads, you can do a test with the multimeter and the ohm scale, which will give you a pretty good indication as to whether or not the capacitor is functioning properly or not. First thing we would want to do would be to short out the two terminals. This does hold a charge. Although we have a bleed resistor located between the two terminals, that doesn't ensure us that this capacitor will be completely discharged when we go to test it. So I want to take something that's got insulated handles on it, such as a pair of needle nose pliers or a screwdriver or pry bar or something, and I'm just going to short across these two to remove any residual current that might be present in the capacitor. At this point, I would like to remove the spade connectors from the two terminals. The orange one comes from the start switch, and this red one goes to the start winding in the motor. I can take my meter, put it to the 2000K or 2M scale, and when I probe across these two terminals, depending on the polarity which I first probe it, I may start at a negative number and I may start at a positive number. But either way I go, I should see resistance value increasing on my meter. So in this case, I started out at two, three, four, five. You can see that the numbers are going up. If I reverse these, I might start in a negative number, but I should go up towards zero and increase. Negative five, four, three, two, one, zero, one. And you can see that either way I probed it, the number did increase on the resistance value. So that's a pretty good indication that this capacitor is probably okay. We can also test the thermal protector while the control bracket is still contained within the control compartment. There's a jumper wire that goes from the thermal protector to terminal A1 on the contactor. I'll need to remove that wire and expose the conductor. There's also a butt splice on the other side of the thermal protector, which is tied to the black motor wire. I'll need to clip that butt splice. Strip the wire back. And then probe between the two wires with my meter in the 2000K or 2M scale. This is a normally closed switch, so I should read a closed 
contacts when I probe these two points. And as you can see, I'm reading zero, zero, zero. So this thermal protector switch is just fine. The last component that's contained on the control bracket is the start switch, but we cannot access the start switch without first removing the entire bracket from the control compartment. So I'll need to unwire the control bracket, unscrew the screws that retain it into the compartment before I can actually lift it out and expose the start switch. It doesn't matter what order you remove these wires in as long as you get all the wires removed. I'll usually start with the ones that go to the cable. Okay. I'll need a 532nd hex key driver as well to remove the bracket as well as the ground screw that's coming from the cable. Once the ground wire and all the other four wires coming from the cable are removed, I can actually remove the control cover, slide the top housing, the level sensor assembly, and everything out of the way. It makes it just a little easier to work on the pump at this point. So I'll remove the remaining wires. I've got the blue motor wire here at 2T1, the orange wire at 14NO. I've already removed the start wire that was attached to the capacitor. Now I'll need my 532nd hex driver again to remove the two bolts that retain the bracket into the control compartment. Once the two retaining bolts are removed from the control bracket, you should be able to lift the control bracket out of the control compartment. Once you get it lifted out of the compartment, you'll have to remove the yellow and gray motor wires that are attached to the start switch. And now our control bracket is completely removed. At this point, I can now test the start switch. The start switch has three terminals on it, pin one, pin two, and pin three. The reading between pin one and pin two should be normally open. The reading between pin two and pin three should be open. And the readings between pins one and pins three should be closed. So as I take my meter in the 2000K or 2M scale, if I go from one to two, I should read an open, and I do. If I go from two to three, I should read an open. I read an open there as well. And I go from one to three, I should read a closed circuit, and I do. So this start switch should be fine. At this point, now my motor wires are exposed. Control bracket is out, and the compartment is empty. I have six wires coming from the motor compartment. This motor has three windings in it. There's a start winding, and there's two main run windings. A couple of these wires are used in configuration with others to constitute these windings. The black and the red wires constitute the start winding. The black and the gray wire constitute a main run winding. And the yellow and the blue wires constitute the second main run winding. This orange wire is only used for 120 volt applications. In order to test this, I'll need to probe between all these wires, between the windings, and also to ground to determine whether or not the windings themselves are good or if there's any shorts that should not be there to chassis ground. So I'm going to have to clip this butt splice off, the black wire. Strip it back. Now, if you refer to chapter 10, page 6, you'll find charts in there for the motor winding tests. In the event that you open up the compartment and it's flooded or there's severe oxidation or tarnishing that's occurred within the compartment on the components, you might want to clip these off and strip them back as well so you can get an accurate reading. Tarnishing and oxidation will affect the readings that you get on these flag terminals. These are nice and clean, so they should be okay. If you notice when you look at the charts on page 6 of chapter 10, there's a couple of different scales that I'm going to use to do these readings. The first scale I want to put my multimeter in is the 200 ohm scale, and I'm going to check the actual windings themselves. Like I said earlier, the black wire and the red wire are the start winding. According to the charts, 
I should reach somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5 ohms on these charts. And as you can see, I am reading right at 2. That's perfect. That's right in the middle. Well, I got black. I might as well go ahead and grab this gray one. Black and gray constitute a run winding. So if I can get this stuck in here, I will go from black to gray. There again, I should read 1.5 to 2.5. And as you can tell by looking at the meter, I've got 1.7, so that winding's good as well. The next reading I would like to take is between the blue and the yellow. That's the other main run winding. There again, 1.5 to 2.5 should be sufficient. And I've got 1.6. I'm also going to do a check between winding 1 and winding 2. Yellow and blue are winding 2, and black and gray are winding 1. So I'm going to go between yellow and black. That's winding one to winding two, and I shouldn't read anything. I don't want to have any shorts between the two main run windings. And as you can see by looking at the meter, I've got an open there. So that reading is good as well. Now that I've checked the windings and they're all good, I want to change my meter to the 2000K or 2M scale, and I want to check everything to chassis ground. I should not read anything at all to chassis ground. Before I do this next reading, I want to talk about the multimeter for just a second. When you're doing continuity checks with a multimeter, there's a few different types of reading that you will possibly get. I showed you one earlier on the contactor when we tested the coil and I read .001. That's a specified resistance value. I also showed you some opens when I tested the contacts between the line side and the load side, which you see represented here with these probing nothing. That's an open. The next reading that I would get would be a closed. And you can see the meter is now reading 000. The next type of reading would be that one right there. As you can see, the meter is bouncing around from random numbers. The current's going through me, and I'm primarily comprised of water. This is what we're going to call a floating short. That's kind of what we're looking for when we're doing this next test, whether or not we've got water in the motor compartment. A direct short will be obvious with the 000. Floating short would show you the random numbers bouncing around on the meter. So I want to find a good place on the chassis. And when I do this, I want to make sure that none of my wires are inadvertently touching the casting or the chassis. So I'll kind of pull my wires up here out of the way. And I'll just probe each wire to chassis ground. I should read open on every one of these wires. So on the blue wire, I read an open. On the orange wire, I read an open. The black wire, I read open. The gray wire, I'm reading open. The yellow wire, I'm reading open. And the red wire, I'm reading open as well. That's a very good indication that this motor is dry, the coil's tested good, and there's probably nothing wrong in this motor compartment. But there's one last test that I'd like to perform just to make sure that the motor is good. In this test, I'm going to use a mega ohm meter. Previously, when we used the multimeter, we were in the 2000K or 2M scale. The higher the scale you put a meter in, the more sensitive it becomes. In this meter, we're going to be in the 1,000 million ohm scale, or 1 billion ohms, which is significantly higher and more sensitive than a standard multimeter. What we're going to do with this is we're going to test the integrity of the insulation of the wires and the insulation that's on the motor windings as well. So I'm going to take my meter, plug it in, turn it on, make sure I'm in the million ohm scale. I'm going to take the lead with the clip on it and clip it to the chassis of the pump so I get a good connection to ground. Then I just want to test each one of these wires directly to chassis ground. A good reading will be 500 million or 500 meg ohms or higher. Anything below that and there's problems with the motor and you should replace the motor. So I'll just touch each one of these. This one's reading between 750 and 1,000 million, so that's good. This one's about the same spot. Also, as you notice, the meter just jumped. That's because my fingers were touching it. That's how sensitive this meter is. Cannot be touching any of the wires with your skin. 
I'm about between 750 and 1,000 again. This one here is good. That one's good as well. And then the last wire. So all of these wires were higher than 500 million ohms, so this motor's fine. We didn't detect any shorts to the chassis ground. The windings read correctly, and it megged out properly as well. This concludes this portion of the operation and troubleshooting portion of the control compartment. Hi, I'm Rich Lapierre. Welcome back to the pump teardown and inspection portion of the video. To remove the suction housing and inspect the stator and liner, we're going to remove, first remove the inlet shroud, four or five sixteen screws. Once you have that removed, we can go ahead and remove the uh, shredder ring. If the shredder ring does not want to come out, you can simply grab a pair of, grip it with a pair of vice grips, strike the vice grips this way with a hammer. Don't strike it down, you could break it. But give it a whack, knock the shredder ring right off. Once you have it off, you can inspect the shredder ring. Uh, you want to inspect for cracks or any kind of breakage. Uh, also want to inspect the teeth, make sure there's no damage to the teeth, they're not worn down. Uh, anything like that. Any kind of damage to the shredder ring, definitely want to replace it. Once the shredder ring is removed, we can go ahead and remove the cutter wheel. Cutter wheel, you want to uh, hit the cutter wheel on the paddles. Don't strike on the cutting teeth. You could risk breaking the teeth off. Take a flat punch, flat chisel, or a simple rounded punch, or you can use a nylon hammer with another hammer. On the paddle, give it a shot. May take one or two shots, depending on how the tension is and how good the, the stator is will determine how many times you have to hit it to get it off. If it is stuck, squirt a little penetrating oil <coughs> excuse me, on the uh, threads, let it sit for a couple minutes and try it again. Once you have it loose, simply spit it off. Once you have it off, you can inspect the cutter wheel for damage. You want to check the cutter teeth, make sure they're not worn down like this one. You can see the edges of the teeth here are worn down from pumping abrasives or high flow, anything like that. Also want to check the paddles, make sure they're not worn and nice and straight edges. Any kind of damage to the cutter wheel like that, go ahead and replace the cutter wheel. Once that's off, we can stand the pump up, remove the four 716 screws that hold the suction housing on. Once you have the four bolts removed, you can remove the suction housing. Keep in mind that sometimes when you remove the suction housing, the liner for the stator may stay installed in the suction housing. If that happens, be sure to grab a pair of vice grips or needle nose pliers and twist it right out of there. You don't want to reinstall a new stator with the old liner in the suction housing. At that point, we can remove the stator. We want to inspect the stator for wear and also any kind of abrasives. Uh, check for abrasives, they can get caught in this void right here to inspect that to see if it is pumping abrasives. Just flip it over on the table, give it a whack, you'll see whatever abrasives get caught in there will come out on the table. <coughs> Excuse me. When you're checking for wear, there's three different kinds of wear. First we'll start with a run dry. Run dry, you'll see that the edges of those stator are worn down flat. You'll have rubber build up in the valleys and you'll get rubber built up on the state, uh, rotor as well. The other kind of wear you want to look for is abrasives. Abrasives, again, will also wear down the, the lobes of the stator, but you won't get any rubber built up on the, on the rotor. You will wear the rotor down. And the third kind of wear you'll see in a stator would be from pumping against overpressure, like a block line, discharges clogged, things like that, or a closed valve. And that'll actually blow a hole in the stator, and you'll actually tear it apart, and then you'll be pumping nothing. So that's the three, kind of wear, three kinds of wear we want to look for. The average life expectancy of a stator is about 10 years. Uh, if you're replacing a stator anytime less than that, you definitely want to look for causes of wear and why you're there changing a stator. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is if the system is pumping petroleum, uh, these are made out of EPDM rubber and they will absorb uh, petroleum products and it'll make the stator swell and prematurely wear it out as well. So once we're done with that, uh, we can inspect the rotor for wear. You can leave it hooked right to the pump, inspect it for wear. Uh, if you do have a run dry situation, rubber built up on the rotor, it can be cleaned right on the, on the pump. Acetone, paint thinner, any kind of petroleum cleaner like that. You can go with a wire brush, green scrubby pad or something like that. Also inspect the rotor. 
If it's pump and abrasives, the rotor will be worn down on the high points. Anything more than a quarter inch wide band, definitely want to replace the rotor. The average life expectancy of a rotor is about 15 years under normal conditions. Once we got everything inspected, we can go ahead and remove the motor head. We're going to do that with a half inch wrench and a half inch socket. Once you have the four bolts removed, we can grab two pry bars and go ahead and remove the motor head from the motor casting. Simply grab the rotor, pull up. Once the motor head is removed from the motor casting, we can inspect the motor cavity for any signs of damage to the stator fields. Uh, damage to the stator fields could come from the armature shaft striking the stator fields due to a bad bearing, rust, uh, things of that nature. Uh, inside the motor cavity is also a wavy washer. Want to make sure to remove the wavy washer and make sure we reinstall it when we rebuild the pump. This will preload the upper bearing. Once we've done our inspection, we've determined the motor is okay. Next, we're going to remove the armature from the motor head. You want to support the end of the shaft and also the bearing end on a block of wood so we don't damage the threads or bend the armature shaft. Eighth inch punch and we're simply going to drive out the guide pin. Once you have the pin removed you can remove the rotor from the armature. We then just simply turn this over. A couple of hits will remove the armature and the bearing from the motor head. Once you have the motor head removed, inspect the armature fields uh, for any sign of damage again from striking the stator fields. Also, any signs of rust or anything like that, we try to clean them up with some uh, scotch brite pad and some paint thinner and things like that um, so we can reuse it. Once we have that apart, we can inspect the bearing pocket for any kind of damage or any kind of spinning uh, from the bearing, spinning in the bearing bore or any signs of pitting. We're going to clean that up with a wire brush. Um, we're going to remove the mechanical seal to remove that. Screwdriver or a pry bar. Simply tap the seal out. And then we're going to inspect the seal bore for any signs of pitting. Any pitting in the seal bore, definitely want to replace the motor head. We want to make sure we get a good seal against the o-ring of the mechanical seal. That completes the repair and teardown inspection section. The next sections we're going